The other topic I'd just like to touch on was the incident of the volcanic ash and its disruption to air transport. Now, most of you will think, how, how did we not see that coming? And yes, the chief scientific advisor sat around a table after the event and said, how did we not see that coming? And we started to analyse the evidence of what we could have looked for to see whether we should have been able to see it coming. And there are five factors which coincided that caused that to be particularly disruptive. And if, even if we'd spotted four of them, we wouldn't have spotted the fifth. And those were that that volcano, indeed Icelandic volcanoes, hadn't erupted very much for the previous 30 years. There was a statistically unlikely 30 years of, of quiescent behaviour compared with the last thousand. The Icelanders have very good records of their volcanic activity. That particular volcano had about 100 metres of ice over its um, cone. And when it blew, it took that and blew it very high up in the atmosphere. We had almost no knowledge of what blowing a volcano through a large ice cap was going to do because it hadn't happened in any place where we'd done any decent measurements. So that was the second thing. It was very unusual. Instead of a volcano producing large particles of ash and it dropping very quickly, and hence no big problem, this stuff blew right up into the stratosphere and then spread around for weeks in very fine-grained particles that we didn't know was going to happen. Third thing was we looked at the meteorology because it affected most of Western Europe. The winds in April predominantly blow from the northwest to the southeast. They don't do it in any other time of the year for weeks at an end, but they do in April statistically. And that happened to be a rather long tail end statistically event. It blew for quite a long time. Easter fell that weekend. Easter can move around by about six weeks, but it happened to be that weekend. And most telling of all was in that 30-year period, going back to the beginning, we'd created civil aviation in Europe at a much greater density than we had 30 years before. So we had no idea what it was going to do to civil aviation. You put five things together which um, caused that, pati that particular event to be particularly disruptive. When we look back, the fact that we took five days to decide what the density and accumulation in an engine of ash could be for them to fly safely, I think was actually amazing that we did it in five days, but most people still look back and think, why didn't they just know that automatically? Um, it was a very complex issue, and it took, it took the rest of our community into a space where we started to examine the impact of extreme events on infrastructure and try to understand the, the effect of those extreme events. Now, I've been at a workshop today with Japanese scientists who've been talking about the effect of the tsunami and the earthquake on Japan. So if you think we've got a problem, they have a really, really difficult problem uh, because the effect they had was absolutely unexpected. And the worst case, I, I hadn't seen these numbers before today, they've now worked out what the height of the waves were in certain parts of the tsunami that hit Japan and some places had a 50 metre high wave that came ashore. And they're now worried as to what they could possibly have done in order to mitigate against that because there's almost no structure you can put in place and they had almost no warning. So that's a, a really difficult issue. So extreme events is a real challenge to infrastructure, less of a challenge than it is to us than it is in Japan, but we all have to start worrying about our dependence on extreme events taking out a significant fracture, fraction of the infrastructure on which we're dependent. 